The Ojibwe, Chippewa, or Salto are an Anishinaabe people in what is currently southern Canada, the northern Midwestern United States, and northern plains. They are indigenous peoples of the subarctic and northeastern woodlands. According to the U.S. Census, Ojibwe people are one of the largest tribal populations among Native American peoples in the United States. In Canada, they are the second largest First Nations population, surpassed only by the Cree. They are one of the most numerous indigenous peoples north of the Rio Grande. The Ojibwe population is approximately 320,000 people, with 170,742 living in the United States as of 2010, and approximately 160,000 living in Canada. In the United States there are 77,940 mainline Ojibwe, 76,760 Salto, and 8,770 Mississauga, organized in 125 bands. In Canada they live from western Quebec to eastern British Columbia. The Ojibwe language is Anishinaabemowin, a branch of the Algonquian language family. They are part of the Council of Three Fires which also include the Odawa and Potawatomi, and of the larger Anishinaabeg, which also include Algonquin, Nipissing, and Oji Cree people. Historically, through the Salto branch, they were a part of the Iron Confederacy with the Cree, Assiniboine, and Métis. The Ojibwe are known for their birchbark canoes, birchbark scrolls, mining and trade in copper, as well as their harvesting of wild rice and maple syrup. Their Maiduawin society is well respected as the keeper of detailed and complex scrolls of events, oral history, songs, maps, memories, stories, geometry, and mathematics. European powers, Canada, and the United States have colonized Ojibwe lands. The Ojibwe signed treaties with settler leaders to surrender land for settlement in exchange for compensation, land reserves and guarantees of traditional rights. Many European settlers moved into the Ojibwe ancestral lands. The Ojibwe language is known as Anishinaabemowin or Ojibwemowin, and is still widely spoken, although the number of fluent speakers has declined sharply. Today, most of the language's fluent speakers are elders. Since the early 21st century, there is a growing movement to revitalize the language and restore its strength as a central part of Ojibwe culture. The language belongs to the Algonquian linguistic group and is descended from Proto-Algonquian. Its sister languages include Blackfoot, Cheyenne, Cree, Fox, Menominee, Potawatomi, and Shawnee among the Northern Plains tribes. Anishinaabemowin is frequently referred to as a Central Algonquian language. Central Algonquian is an area grouping, however, rather than a linguistic genetic one. Ojibwemowin is the fourth most spoken native language in North America after Navajo, Cree, and Inuktitut. Many decades of fur trading with the French established the language as one of the key trade languages of the Great Lakes and the Northern Great Plains. The popularity of the epic poem The Song of Hiawatha, written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in 1855, publicized the Ojibwe culture. The epic contains many toponyms that originate from Ojibwe words. According to Ojibwe oral history and from recordings in birch bark scrolls, the Ojibwe originated from the mouth of the St. Lawrence River on the Atlantic coast of what is now Quebec. They traded widely across the continent for thousands of years as they migrated, and knew of the canoe routes to move north, west to east, and then south in the Americas. The identification of the Ojibwe as a culture or people may have occurred in response to contact with Europeans. The Europeans preferred to deal with groups, and tried to identify those they encountered. According to Ojibwe oral history, seven great Mayages cowrie shells appeared to them in the Wabanakiang land of the dawn, i.e., eastern land to teach them the mead way of life. One of the Mayages was too spiritually powerful and killed the people in the Wabanakiang when they were in its presence. The six others remained to teach, while the one returned into the ocean. The six established Dudum clans for people in the east, symbolized by animals. The five original Anishinaabe Dudum were the Wawazisi, Bullhead, Baswenazi, Echo Maker, i.e., Crane, Anaawan, Pintail Duck, Nook Tender, i.e., Bear, and Muzunsi, Little Moose. The six Mayages then returned to the ocean as well. 
If the seventh had stayed, it would have established the Thunderbird Dudum. At a later time, one of these Mayages appeared in a vision to relate a prophecy. It said that if the Anishinaabeg did not move farther west, they would not be able to keep their traditional ways alive because of the many new pale-skinned settlers who would arrive soon in the east. Their migration path would be symbolized by a series of smaller turtle islands, which was confirmed with Myagis shells, i.e., cowrie shells. After receiving assurance from their allied brothers, i.e., Mi'kmaq and father, i.e., Abenaki of their safety to move inland. The Anishinaabeg gradually migrated west along the St. Lawrence River to the Ottawa River to Lake Nipissing, and then to the Great Lakes. The first of the smaller turtle islands was Munia, where Munion, present-day Montreal, developed. The second stopping place was in the vicinity of the Wayanag Gakabika concave waterfalls, i.e., Niagara Falls. At their third stopping place, near the present-day city of Detroit, Michigan, the Anishinaabeg divided into six groups, of which the Ojibwe was one. The first significant new Ojibwe culture center was there, fourth stopping place, on Manadu Minizink Manitoulin Island. Their first new political center was referred to as their, fifth stopping place, in their present country at Bovitink, Sault Ste. Marie. Continuing their westward expansion, the Ojibwe divided into the, northern branch, following the north shore of Lake Superior, and the, southern branch, along its south shore. As the people continued to migrate westward, the northern branch divided into a westerly group and a southerly group. The southern branch and the southerly group of the northern branch came together at their sixth stopping place on Spirit Island. Located in the St. Louis River estuary at the western end of Lake Superior. This has since been developed as the present-day Duluth Superior Cities. The people were directed in a vision by the Mayagis being to go to the place where there is food i.e., wild rice upon the waters. Their second major settlement, referred to as their seventh stopping place, was at Chagawamakong or Jagawamakong, French, Chekamegan, on the southern shore of Lake Superior, near the present La Pointe, Wisconsin. The westerly group of the northern branch migrated along the Rainy River, Red River of the North, and across the northern Great Plains until reaching the Pacific Northwest. Along their migration to the west, they came across many Mayages, or cowrie shells, as told in the prophecy. The first historical mention of the Ojibwe occurs in the French Jesuit Relation of 1640, a report by the missionary priests to their superiors in France. Through their friendship with the French traders, Carreres des Bois and voyagers, the Ojibwe gained guns, began to use European goods, and began to dominate their traditional enemies, the Lakota and Fox to their west and south. They drove the Sioux from the upper Mississippi region to the area of the present-day Dakotas, and forced the Fox down from northern Wisconsin. The latter allied with the Sauk for protection. By the end of the 18th century, the Ojibwe controlled nearly all of present-day Michigan, northern Wisconsin, and Minnesota, including most of the Red River area. They also controlled the entire northern shores of Lakes Huron and Superior on the Canadian side and extending westward to the Turtle Mountains of North Dakota. In the latter area, the French Canadians called them Ojibwe or Salto. The Ojibwe were part of a long-term alliance with the Anishinaabe Odawa and Potawatomi peoples, called the Council of Three Fires. They fought against the Iroquois Confederacy, based mainly to the southeast of the Great Lakes in present-day New York, and the Sioux to the west. The Ojibwe stopped the Iroquois advance into their territory near Lake Superior in 1662. Then they formed an alliance with other tribes such as the Huron and the Odawa who had been displaced by the Iroquois invasion. Together they launched a massive counterattack against the Iroquois and drove them out of Michigan and southern Ontario until they were forced to flee back to their original homeland in upstate New York. At the same time the Iroquois were subjected to attacks by the French. This was the beginning of the end of the Iroquois Confederacy as they were put on the defensive. The Ojibwe expanded eastward, taking over the lands along the eastern shores of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. 
In 1745, they adopted guns from the British in order to repel the Dakota people in the Lake Superior area, pushing them to the south and west. In the 1680s the Ojibwe defeated the Iroquois who dispersed their Huron allies and trading partners. This victory allowed them a golden age, in which they ruled uncontested in southern Ontario. Often, treaties known as peace and friendship treaties were made to establish community bonds between the Ojibwe and the European settlers. These established the groundwork for cooperative resource sharing between the Ojibwe and the settlers. The United States and Canada viewed later treaties offering land sessions as offering territorial advantages. The Ojibwe did not understand the land session terms in the same way because of the cultural differences in understanding the uses of land. The governments of the US and Canada considered land a commodity of value that could be freely bought, owned and sold. The Ojibwe believed it was a fully shared resource, along with air, water and sunlight, despite having an understanding of territory. At the time of the treaty councils, they could not conceive of separate land sales or exclusive ownership of land. Consequently, today, in both Canada and the US, legal arguments in treaty rights and treaty interpretations often bring to light the differences in cultural understanding of treaty terms to come to legal understanding of the treaty obligations. In part because of its long trading alliance, the Ojibwe allied with the French against Great Britain and its colonists in the Seven Years' War, also called the French and Indian War. After losing the war in 1763, France was forced to cede its colonial claims to lands in Canada and east of the Mississippi River to Britain. After Pontiac's war and adjusting to British colonial rule, the Ojibwe allied with British forces and against the United States in the War of 1812. They had hoped that a British victory could protect them against United States settlers' encroachment on their territory. Following the war, the United States government tried to forcibly remove all the Ojibwe to Minnesota, west of the Mississippi River. The Ojibwe resisted, and there were violent confrontations. In the Sandy Lake tragedy, several hundred Ojibwe died because of the federal government's failure to deliver fall annuity payments. The government attempted to do this in the Keweenaw Peninsula in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Through the efforts of Chief Buffalo and the rise of popular opinion in the U.S. against Ojibwe removal, the bands east of the Mississippi were allowed to return to reservations on ceded territory. A few families were removed to Kansas as part of the Potawatomi removal. In British North America, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 following the Seven Years' War governed the cession of land by treaty or purchase. Subsequently, France ceded most of the land in Upper Canada to Great Britain. Even with the Jay Treaty signed between Great Britain and the United States following the American Revolutionary War, the newly formed United States did not fully uphold the treaty. As it was still preoccupied by war with France, Great Britain ceded to the United States much of the lands in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, parts of Illinois and Wisconsin, and northern Minnesota and North Dakota to settle the boundary of their holdings in Canada. In 1807, the Ojibwe joined three other tribes, the Odawa, Potawatomi and Wyandotte people, in signing the Treaty of Detroit. The agreement, between the tribes and William Hull, representing the Michigan Territory, gave the United States a portion of today's southeastern Michigan and a section of Ohio near the Maumee River. The tribes were able to retain small pockets of land in the territory. The Battle of the Brule was an October 1842 battle between the Lapointe Band of Ojibwe Indians and a war party of Dakota Indians. The battle took place along the Brule River Bois Brule, in what is today northern Wisconsin and resulted in a decisive victory for the Ojibwe. In Canada, many of the land cession treaties the British made with the Ojibwe provided for their rights for continued hunting, fishing and gathering of natural resources after land sales. The government signed numbered treaties in northwestern Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. British Columbia had not signed treaties until the late 20th century, and most areas have no treaties yet. The government and First Nations are continuing to negotiate treaty land entitlements and settlements. 
The treaties are constantly being reinterpreted by the courts because many of them are vague and difficult to apply in modern times. The numbered treaties were some of the most detailed treaties signed for their time. The Ojibwe nation set the agenda and negotiated the first numbered treaties before they would allow safe passage of many more British settlers to the prairies. Ojibwe communities have a strong history of political and social activism. Long before contact, they were closely aligned with Odawa and Potawatomi people in the Council of the Three Fires. From the 1870s to 1938, the Grand General Indian Council of Ontario attempted to reconcile multiple traditional models into one cohesive voice to exercise political influence over colonial legislation. In the West, 16 Plains Cree and Ojibwe bands formed the Allied Bands of Quipel in 1910 in order to redress concerns about the failure of the government to uphold Treaty Force promises.